apologize in advance for any popping sounds that comes from this microphone. Once upon a time, three different groups on three separate occasions, each decided to form a legal organization. In preparing their respective organizations, each group prepared their mission statement. This is what the first group included in their mission statement. Quote, to propagate the Christian religion to such people as yet live in darkness and miserable ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God, end quote. That was the first group. The second group's mission statement stated that, quote, that they pursuing with peaceable and legal minds their sober, serious, and religious intentions of godly edifying themselves and one another in the holy Christian faith and worship, end quote. And the third group stated that their purpose for organizing was for the propagation of the gospel in the parts of America not cultivated and planted. Believe it or not, the organizations that were being formed in that time were not church organizations. They did not come together to form a great Methodist church or a great Catholic church or even a Presbyterian church. The organizations that were being formed represented the colony of Virginia, the colony of Rhode Island, and the colony of North Carolina. So it is safe to say that the original intent and purpose for the existence of those colonies that later became states of Virginia, Rhode Island, and North Carolina were to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. When one examines the charters of the other original colonies, such as Connecticut, such as Delaware, New Jersey, Georgia, and even the state of New York, there are similar mission statements or charters. Their desires were to encourage religion and virtue, to preserve true Christian and civil liberty, and to promote godly government. This is why it is stated that America was originally founded on Judeo-Christian principles. What happened to us? What happened to us? What caused us to lose our liberty and forget who we are as a nation? What caused us to drift away from our original intent and purpose? Here we are, four centuries later, after the French and Indian War, four centuries later, after the American Revolutionary War, a ratified constitution, the Louisiana Purchase, the War of 1812, the Trail of Tears, the Industrial Revolution, the Civil War, Reconstruction, the invention of the telephone, the invention of the light bulb, the invention of the automobile, segregation laws, the invention of the airplane, World War I, the women's suffrage movement, the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, World War II, the military-industrial complex, the removal of prayer in schools in 1962, the war in Vietnam, civil rights movement, the welfare state, legalized abortion, video games, cell phone, social media, gender confusion. Four centuries later, as we increased in knowledge 
and achieved a level of superiority in technological and military advances, we became opulent. We became intellectual. We became fat, believing that we are now more knowledgeable and wiser than God himself. And therefore, we're living at a time where we have no need of him. Our government leaders became greedy. They compromised Christian principles for temporal power. If you would please turn to Amos chapter 2. Amos chapter 2. The book of Amos is a few chapters after the book of Daniel. You've got Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and then Amos. Amos was a, a shepherd and a fruit picker in the land of Tekoa, which was a Judean village. He didn't have a priestly background or a formal education in the school of prophets, and yet God called him to be a prophet. Amos chapter 2, beginning at verse 4, it reads, Thus said the Eternal, For three transgressions of Judah, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have despised the law of the eternal, and have not kept his commandments. And their lives cause them to err, after the which their fathers have walked. But I will send a fire, verse 5, upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. In verse 5, the palace represents the seat of government. The palace represents the house of justice and order. The palace represents the tabernacle of civil authority. And just like verse 5, even today, it's burning as we speak. Is being perverted, it's being ransacked, and obliterated even now. The purpose of civil government is to punish evildoers, defend their nation in war, and praise those who do well. Today, governments do the opposite. They oppress the innocent and reward the criminal. They overtax, they overspend, and they underperform. Instead of defending citizens, they open their borders to human trafficking. They open their borders to drugs, to gun smuggling, to crime. Those who do well are placed in jail. This palace, also known as the state, believe that they are accountable to no one, not even God. In fact, the state desires to be God. This tabernacle, known as the seat of government, is in shambles, and it needs to be repaired. Another tabernacle has been heavily ransacked. If you would, please turn to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. This chapter primarily deals with the subject of head coverings, but that is not the focus of this message. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, it reads, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. Chapter 11, verse 3 says, and I find this funny, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. Please. Society doesn't believe that, and many Christians, professing ones that is, don't believe that the head of every man is Christ. The belief today is that man answers to no one but himself. Jesus said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. But society 
And many professing Christians say, oh no, your commandments and your laws are done away with. Remember, we're no longer under the law. We're under grace. You, Jesus, can't tell us what to do anymore. We go our own way. It continues to say in that verse that the head <laughs> of every man is Christ and that the head of the woman is the man. Preposterous in some people's minds. Not today. That phrase is a joke to many people, both in the church and outside the church. Submit to your husbands? That's fighting words. That's misogynistic. People will take their weaves off and fight you on that verse. <laughs> they want no part of that. Many women do not agree with this verse, and sad to say, many men don't believe it either. In some cases, the husband has made the position and made the decision to abdicate his God-given role as the leader and head of the family, as a husband and father, choosing instead to accept the role of the wife. He's self-emasculated. In some cases, the man has absolutely no problem at all being the husband and head of the family. But that role is not enough for him. He wants more. In fact, he wants to be God. He wants the position of Jesus Christ. He desires to be worshiped and adored. He wants constant adulation. He wants Jesus' position. The same is true for the woman, at least some women. She's not satisfied with her position as the wife, the keeper of the home, and mother, she wants to have the role of the husband. After all, in some cases, she's more educated. She has her bachelor's degree. She has her master's degree. She has a PhD, her JD, her MOUSE. She's got all kinds of degrees that you can't even pronounce. She makes more money. Get in an argument with her husband. She can talk circles around him. He doesn't stand a chance. And therefore, over time, she becomes the head of the household. In some cases, that's not enough. She, too, wants to be God. Worshipped, adored, and idolized. And the children in the home are observing all of this chaos instability, and dysfunction in the home. And eventually, the children grow up without the foundation of godly principles and virtue, and they later become unstable and rebellious. This is where we are. We're living at a time when we can't even define what a man is. We can't define what a woman is not even biologically. We can't even boldly say that a man is an adult male with the XY chromosome, that that part of the tabernacle one cannot change. God declared that there were only two sexes. He declared that there are only two genders. But man, in his infinite wisdom, says otherwise. The tabernacle known as the family unit, known as the home, is out of order and is in shambles. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, God prepared a new generation of Israelites to enter into the promised land, which was a type of the kingdom of God. He warned them of what would happen if they obeyed him and what would happen if they disobeyed him. After describing to the nation the benefits of obedience, 
In verse 15 of chapter 28, God, through Moses, warned the nation. In verse 15 of chapter 28, it reads, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the eternal thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Verse 16, Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and thy store. Verse 18, Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of your sheep. Cursed shall you be when you come in. Cursed shall you be when you go out. The eternal shall send upon you cursing, vexation, and rebuke, and all that you set your hand unto to do, for to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. The eternal shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee, until he have consumed thee from off the land, whither you goest to possess it. The eternal shall smite thee with a consumption, and with a fever, with an inflammation, and with an extreme burning, with the sword, and with blasting, with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until you perish. And your heaven that is over your head shall be brass, and the earth that is under you shall be iron. The eternal shall make the rain of your land powder and dust. From heaven it shall come down upon you until you be destroyed. After condemning the Pharisees for their hypocrisy and for their wickedness, Jesus told them that because they rejected him, their house would be left unto them desolate. In this generation, where we are today, there is hypocrisy and there is wickedness in the land. We have professing Christian ministers across the country, around the world, who preach love, they preach peace, they preach justice, but in practice, they enjoin themselves to others who do evil and take pride. They participate in sexual promiscuity. We have children at the present time in this very land who are ruling over us. They've terrorized our cities. They've burned down our houses and buildings of commerce in the name of rebellion. They are the modern day terrorists and supremacists of this century. In the previous century, the terrorists wore white sheets. Today, they wear bandanas, they wear baseball caps, they wear t-shirts, they wear jeans. Some wear a specific color as part of their gang affiliation. Murder and robbery are part of their initiation process. They've even infiltrated the entertainment industry, which promotes rebellion against God, which advocates for promiscuity and narcissism an industry that glorifies crime. They've terrorized our inner cities, turning them into third world cities. They're the byproducts of the welfare system, the welfare state, which encouraged the mother to be the head of the house and the natural father to go away and be replaced by the government and the welfare check. Much of the violent crime in our nation is the result of fatherless homes and the promotion of the matriarchy. Our business leaders, leaders in banking and commerce, have committed acts of theft over the ages. Some major companies have even been involved in initiating Ponzi schemes, creative accounting schemes, extortion, and tax evasion. Some companies have even gone so far as to contaminate water sources just to make money. Meanwhile, we continue to ignore God's dietary laws, which were created for the benefit of mankind. We've decided instead to go our own way. 
And because of these decisions, curse it, we are in the city. And curse it, we are in the field. The tabernacle, known as the nation, our native country, is in disarray and has been mutilated. Now, church, knowing these things, knowing the chaotic conditions that you live in, what is it that inspires you to continue to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, to continue on with the joy, with the hope, with the love that God requires of us, even in these chaotic days. We're dealing with food shortages. We're dealing with increasing crime in various parts of the nation, disrespect for authority. How can you be joyful during these moments? I'll tell you how. If you would, please turn to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. In spite of the circumstances, chaos, the dysfunction that we're living in, in this society, Jesus Christ gives us a reason, the strength to continue to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, even in these perilous times. In this chapter, Jesus encouraged his disciples, John chapter 16, who became sorrowful after hearing Jesus warned that his followers would not just be kicked out of the synagogues, but that they would be even killed. John chapter 16, verse 33, reads as follows. It says, these things have I, Jesus Christ, spoken unto you that in me, Jesus Christ, not in your wealth, not in your material possessions, not in the way you wear your hair, not in the way you shine your shoes, not in your children, not in your grandchildren, that in me, Jesus Christ, you might have peace. In him, you might have peace. He goes on to say, in the world, in this society, in this age, in this generation, you shall have tribulation, trouble, chaos, all around. There's been chaos in this country up and down throughout the ages. In the world, you shall have tribulation. But with all that trouble, Jesus goes on to say, be of good cheer. Be happy. Why? Because I have overcome the world, Jesus says. That verse alone should make you want to do your happy dance. It should give you the strength to continue on. Because just as Jesus overcame the world, this same Jesus who lives in you by his spirit and who desires to live in many and all of us will strengthen and equip you to overcome this world. Another reason to continue to celebrate with joy, if you would turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. In the chapter, Paul described the benefits of walking in and being led by the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 8, we'll begin at verse 35. Romans chapter 8, verse 35, it reads, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or tribulation, or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril, which is danger, or sword, you can read gun into that word. As it is written, verse 36, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Paul goes on to say, by the Spirit of God, and he answers it. Verse 37, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, 
nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We are also to remain joyful during these perilous times because we believe, as Paul did, that we are more than conquerors in Christ. We are winners through Christ Jesus if we continue to live lives of overcoming and if we fulfill that royal law to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And in Revelation chapter 19, if you would turn there, it provides a, a description of a rescue operation that Jesus Christ is going to execute. Revelation chapter 19. We'll begin at verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11, it reads, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood as a testimony to him dying on the stake. And his name is called the Word of God. Verse 14 reads, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Please skip to verse 19. Verse 19. It reads, And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him, Jesus Christ the king that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken. And with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. We continue to celebrate this festival with the joy that God has given us because we are assured that our deliverer is coming. He is coming to permanently restore order on this earth. The corrupt governments of this world will be removed. Outside of national repentance and true and real fasting, the only one who can fix this mess of a world is Jesus Christ, who will return to this earth. The Feast of Tabernacles serves as a reminder of where we currently dwell and where we will dwell or tabernacle in the future. We currently dwell in this earthen vessel known as the human body with all of its imperfections on the temporal earth God is reminding us that the day will come that we will dwell in a permanent, eternal body with no imperfections gifted by Christ. God's reminding us that the troubles in this society, in this life, will not go on forever. Evil will not continue to rule the day. The King of Glory will return to this earth to mandate righteousness to install peace, to root out evil, and to establish his kingdom. He will dwell with us as he always desired to. We also celebrate this feast because even our enemy will have a tabernacle prepared for him, a permanent lake of fire with brimstone to never imprison the nations ever again. But in the meantime, we have to recognize the current state of the tabernacle. It's damaged and it needs to be repaired. The title of this message is 
recognizing a damaged tabernacle.